Well, a big thank you to our worship team for leading us in this time this morning. Some weeks ago, Pastor David contacted me and asked whether I'd be available to preach on this occasion, and it worked. And uh, he sent me an email confirming it and said, your choice, free choice. And uh, I began thinking about it and praying about it, and I looked at some passages here and there, and nothing much seemed to gel. So I attended the members' meeting a couple of weeks back, and uh, as the financial statement was being presented and the budget for the new year, um, it was mentioned by one of our leaders that uh, from either the church council or to the church council had been suggested that we have a message on giving. And I thought, something just jolted in my heart. I could do that. Maybe that's something to think about. And then a little while later, as Pastor David was chairing the meeting, he acknowledged the fact that that request had been made and said it's a bit awkward for the pastors to preach on a topic like that because there's so many points of view out there in the audience and the congregation. And it's a bit hard for the pastors to address it and not tread on people's toes. He said that Alan Greaves preaching on the 9th of July, maybe it's something he could take up. And I thought, well, <laughs> there's a word of affirmation. <laughs> and when it comes from somebody like Pastor David who walks so closely with Jesus, you've got to listen to that affirmation. <laughs> and so this morning I'm going to preach on giving. I was waiting to listen for groans and see who got up and left. Peter Kirby nearly did, but he decided to stay. But I heard good. I'm sorry that I... Well, no, I'm not really sorry. I was going to say I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a PowerPoint presentation to share with you. One of the banes of my life when I was in a position of having to preach each Sunday, was having to prepare a PowerPoint to go with it. <laughs> Sometimes the PowerPoint took me longer than the sermon to, to put together. And uh, when I look at the PowerPoints that the guys use now, uh, I don't know where their resources are, but they're so captivating and they catch your attention. And, and I just seem to be able to find basic stuff and then press the button in and out of order and distracts me and... So, uh, no, I'm not sorry that I don't have a PowerPoint, but I am sorry that you've got to look at my ugly face <laughs> instead because you don't have that diversion. But before I share some thoughts on giving, I, I want to lead us in prayer. Some years ago, I visited a lady whom I knew, and uh, she was in hospital, an elderly lady, and um, the prognosis was not good. She was a lady that was associated loosely with a church of another denomination and occasionally she would attend there. And I guess she would have put herself in the bracket of being a Christian. And as I talked with her for a while and as I was getting near the end of the visit, I, I asked her, I said, would you like me to pray for you? She said, oh, no, thanks. And I shared that story at her funeral uh, some months later. And uh, I could see some, usually family members, most of them family members that knew her, sort of a bit of a snigger, that would be her. And others, I think, felt a bit of disgust. Fancy not wanting to pray. You know what? I admired her for her stand. I admired her for her honesty. Because I think too often we will accept prayer or pray and really not mean what we're saying. This morning I want to lead us in prayer as we consider this topic of giving. And I'm going to conclude the prayer with the typical word, Amen. A word that means, Lord, let it be. This is my heart's desire. And I want to say to you that if the prayer touches your heart, if it's an expression of your desire to God, you might like to express your Amen as well. It's a prayer based on scripture and I invite you to share it with me. Father, as we 
consider this topic of giving. Sometimes a contentious issue. Sometimes a topic that is not a comfortable one for us. It is my prayer along with that of the psalmist that the words of my mouth and the meditations and responses of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. I, like I'm sure many of you, have heard some terrible messages on giving. Manipulative messages. The era of the televangelist is one thing that comes to mind. Many of those evangelists were genuine in what they were on about. But some just used it as a means to manipulate the generation of funding. A couple of years ago I became interested in a particular devotional guide that was free, promoted free. I'd read some back copies and I thought, yeah, I might subscribe to that. And I received the first issue and I sent off a donation because I realised that those sorts of things cost and this was a ministry and I uh, wanted to support them in their ministry. But after a while I, I began receiving messages that they have felt constrained to support another ministry and they'd like you to contribute toward it. I thought, that's okay. I, I don't mind people putting things out there if the Lord has laid it on their hearts. I've even said to some of our church council leaders, look, if you've got a special issue, bring it to our attention as church members. Sometimes we have funding there that we're waiting on the Lord to guide us as to where it should go and if you don't make it known, we don't know. And uh, I'm grateful that when I look at the financial statement, there's that building fund there. Nobody's saying you have to give to it, but it's there. And uh, if the Lord touches our hearts, we can contribute toward it. But this particular devotional guide went a, a little step further and they would send emails and say, oh, look, if we haven't got the money by such and such a date, we won't be able to do that ministry. We really need you to give. I've got to tell you, that gets up my nose. I have problems with that. My understanding of scripture and my own personal practice has taught me that giving grows out of an attitude. And if there's one word you want to take home from this message this morning, it would be the word attitude. Because I strongly believe that in dependent upon our attitude toward God and our relationship with him will dictate our attitude toward giving to God's work. Attitude. One of the Old Testament characters that has really challenged me in that whole area is that old guy Job. Um, Job would be what I would call the Elon Musk of uh, his age. Read a little bit about Elon Musk um, last year. 52-year-old guy worth $234 billion. Who on earth needs $234 billion? Sadly, I read on that he's had three marriages all ended in divorce. And is now in a fourth marriage, a fourth relationship that's not yet solemnised as a marriage. He has ten children from those relationships. Well, Twiggy Forrest, the Australian rich man, worth 27 and a quarter billion dollars. He and his wife have a strong desire to be philanthropists and make a lot of that money available to help particular charities and what have you. Job would fit into those sorts of categories, a very, very wealthy guy of his day. And in the opening verses of the book of Job, we read that uh, he was a man who was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. And then it lists his uh, 
what do you call him, his bank account, if you like. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in the entire area. But little by little, these things were stripped away from him. He received word that some thieves had come in and taken his livestock and killed off the servants who were caring for them. He had word that a strong wind blew through, a tornado of some sort, a hurricane came through and uh, while his children were partying together, the house and, uh, was destroyed and uh, all the kids were killed. And suddenly this, this fantastic empire that Job had was decimated. He had nothing. When we get to the end of chapter 1, we read that Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Yes, that's understandable. He grieved at losing all that he had, particularly his family, I guess. And then he shaved his head and he fell to the ground to worship. And he said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave what I had and the Lord has taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. You see the attitude of Job? Those possessions were not his God, but rather a gift from God. Those possessions were something that good fortune, if you want to put it that way, had blessed him with a long life's road, but he never held on to it. Even when it was taken away from him, he could worship God and say, look, I came with nothing. I leave with nothing. What I had was not my own. What a great attitude. You know, for quite some years now, I've been serving as a chaplain at the local Kabulcha Hospital, which, among its other aspects of hospital work, has an emphasis on the maternity wards and the special care nursery. And I can say that over all of those years, I have never yet had a midwife come down to me and say, guess what? I've just delivered a child with a silver spoon in its mouth. <laughs> never happened. And I doubt it's ever going to happen because we come into this world with nothing. All that we have is an accumulation of things as life goes on. For some, it is plenty. For others, it is struggle street. The psalmist says in Psalm 24 and verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Everything is God's, not ours. Everything belongs to him, not us. This statement comes again to that effect in Psalm 50, in verse 10. God says, For all the animals of the forest are mine, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains and all the animals of the field are mine. God owns it all. In the olden days, when Ros and I used to walk the streets with Moses, we used to sing a song based on that psalm. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills and the suns and stars that shine. These are my fathers. Now wait there, I've missed a line. 
Wonderful riches more than tongue can tell. These are my father's, so they're mine as well. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills and I know he cares for me. Friends, since the days of Adam, God has said, everything here is for you. For you to use, for you to look after. Oh, there were some boundaries. But those boundaries were minimal. And sadly, Adam and Eve tripped up and overstepped the boundary. But this world in which we live is a gift to us from God. The talents and the gifts that we have are from God to use for him to benefit others. I want to say that our giving is not about quantity but about quality. As Jesus sat one day with his disciples in the temple, we read in Luke chapter 21 verses 1 to 4, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts into the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had. Friends, never ever think that because you can't give a bundle of dollars that that's not acceptable to God. God looks at the heart. He looks at the attitude, the motivation. And God condemns falsehood, phoniness. Throughout the Old Testament in a number of situations, like Jeremiah chapter 6 or Hosea chapter 8 and verse 13, God says to his people through his respective prophets, look, don't bring all your precious perfumes from those overseas countries and offer them to me as an altar. Don't bring in all your sacrifices when you don't mean it. They're a stench to me. They stink. That's a challenge, isn't it? Do we give out of an attitude of gratitude? Or do we give just because it's a habit? Or just because our arm has been twisted? So, how do we develop this concept of giving? How do we develop our attitude? Back in the Old Testament, the idea of tithing is brought to our attention. Sometimes you will hear our pastors say, uh, we're going to be waited on for our tithes and offerings. In my mind, the tithe is that which we bring into the house of the Lord to support the work of the local church. The offerings are that which we be, give over and above for a special cause of some sort. That's how I function. That may not be right. That's the way we function. But in Deuteronomy chapter 14, when the law is being presented to the people of God as to how they ought to live their lives, in the area of giving, uh, Moses conveys this message from the Lord. You must set aside a tithe of your crops one-tenth of all the crops you harvest each year. Bring this tithe to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honoured, and eat it there in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. I've got to say, I'm extremely grateful to parents who taught me this concept of tithing. 
And I received my first pocket money, two shillings. 24 pennies, modern day currency, 25 cents. I was given two bob and I was given a bundle of little envelopes that I see people at church using. When the offering plate come round, they would put these envelopes in. And, and I was taught that out of my two shillings, I would put tuppence halfpenny into an envelope and take it to church. I probably didn't understand what that was all about, but that's what people did, so I did it. It was the religious thing to do, if you like. And let me say, there's a danger in doing things just because it's religious. In years to come, when I had my first job as an apprentice motor mechanic, at the age of 16, I received my first weekly pay packet, $14.76 and $1.48 went into offerings. It was the amount before the government got their hands on it with taxes, the gross amount. And I gave that tithe as a practice. And little by little I realised that this concept of tithing was not a religious thing to do. But everything was God's. All that I had was a gift from God. Any resources that I had accumulated, any gifts that I had, any talents that I had, it was a gift from God. And here's God saying, would you just give me back 10% to show your love for me? Bring it into the house of the Lord to worship me. And as Ros and I were Preparing to get married, we talked about this whole concept of giving and we have based our whole marriage on the basis of giving to the Lord a tenth of our income because we are grateful for what God has given us and to be giving back just one tenth is minuscule to all that he has given us. That's our deep desire to worship him with our tithe. The book of Leviticus emphasises the same thing, this aspect of the law, to bring a tithe into the house of the Lord, to worship the Lord with. I'm grateful that I had a mother who taught me that from the very beginning. And you know, my mum's 93 years of age now, and uh, we duck down every couple of months to see mum and dad in New South Wales. And I doubt that there is ever a time that I would come away from that visit without mum at some point saying, we are very blessed. That's a catch cry that she has. We'll sit down to a meal and give thanks and she'll say, we are very blessed. She'll talk about people that come to care for her or take her out and out. I'm just so very blessed. That's her attitude. An attitude of gratitude. And I'm so grateful that Mum has instilled that into me and I now can appreciate just how wonderfully blessed I have been and continue to be. Some people will say, oh yeah, but that idea of tithing, that, that's just law, that's legalism. You know, we're in the New Testament now, we're under the covenant of grace. You don't have to do that. They might be right. If you look at it that way, if you look at it as a legalism. But you know, long before Moses, I see the idea of tithing was part and practice of some of the greats. That old fellow Abraham. He had to go and rescue his nephew from that wicked city, Sodom, and it wasn't an easy thing. There was a bit of a, a battle ensued and Abraham came away from that battle with a lot of booty, a lot of loot. And having left the city of Sodom behind, he's walking along and he meets a guy by the name of Melchizedek, a high priest of God. 
don't know a lot about Melchizedek, but he seems to have been pretty important because when you get to the book of Hebrews, we're talking about the high priesthood of Jesus and it says that Jesus was a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Pretty important priest. And as Abraham had this contact well, with Melchizedek, he gave to Melchizedek as a gift to God a tenth of the booty that he had received from Sodom. He tithed it. A couple of generations later, there's the man Jacob. Jacob had had a severe falling out with his brother Esau, a little bit of conniving with his mother and and Esau hated Jacob because Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright. And Esau was wanting to kill Jacob. And mum got word of this and spoke to dad and they agreed that Jacob should go back to the old homeland and find for himself a, a wife there, get out of this difficult situation. And as Jacob's on his way, nightfall comes, lies down, and in Genesis Chapter 28, verse 22, we see that Jacob's got his head on a rock as a pillow and he's sleeping and he has this dream. Dream of a ladder, angels going up and down. In that dream, God speaks to him, reminding him that he's still his, even though he's perhaps done the wrong thing, even though he's perhaps on the run, God's still in contact with him. And when Jacob woke from that night's sleep, he gathered other rocks around and he, he built like a can, a memorial, and he called it Bethel, a word which means house of God. And there before he left that place, he promised to give the Lord one-tenth of everything that he ever received. You see, that's long before the law. It was just an idea that they practiced. And I'm going to say that I have grown to a point where I don't practice tithing as something of the law, but I practice it as my expression to say thanks to God for all that he has given to me. When we get to the book of Malachi, we're just about to jump into the New Testament into that area of grace, if you like. Over the years, uh, the people of Israel had gone their own way. Oh, they said, yeah, we follow God. When things got tough, oh God, can you help us? That sort of an attitude. In some of the finer things of commitment, they got away from the Lord. And in Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 to 10, we read these words. I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when, when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God, says the Lord? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try me, put me to the test. Wow. Here is God calling his people to come back to him and honour him with their tithes. Bring it into the storehouse. Why? Well, God's house has to function. There are personnel 
that need to receive an income. There's maintenance that needs to be done. There's stock that needs to be purchased. Bring it into the storehouse. Don't cheat on me. It's my house where people come to worship me. And if you think I'm kidding, put me to the test. And I will open up the storehouse of heaven and bless you in such a way it will blow your socks off. Now friends, when God says put me to the test, pretty certainly doesn't mean that you come in and say, okay Lord, here's my tithe now, you, you come good with your bit. Because we're instructed in scripture that we shouldn't do that to God. And what God is saying here is more, when you bring your offering into me, trust me. Trust me, I will bless you. And as I look back over my life, wow, has God blessed me. When I started college, God's call upon my life to pastoral ministry became a strong reality when we were just six months married. We were buying our first house at a ridiculous mortgage rate of something like 16%. We were both working at the time. I was a qualified diesel fitter and enjoying my work. Roz was a legal stenographer with a firm of solicitors. A good income. But we realised that if I go into college to train, that means stepping out of my job. No such thing as hex or student allowances in those days. It was a step of faith. And after we processed it all, and it became very clear that yes, this is a step of faith that the Lord wanted us to undertake, our first son was born in December. 1976 so Roz came out of the workforce and we didn't have her income and I started college the following February three months later we did so because God called and there were many times when we would be faced with a bill that had to be paid and I'd get that bill and say, hey Lord, this is your problem. There were numerous times when people would give us a gift. And do you know the amount of that gift would be the exact amount of a bill that we had received? They didn't know that. God knew. And in those months and years when we did not have an income... I can tell you there was not one meal that we missed out on. Not one. We still met our mortgage payments. We still ran our motor vehicle. We still fed our kids. God opened up the storehouses of heaven and provided. A few years later on we had two kids and we were in ministry and I was receiving an income and I can remember clearly we were about to embark on our four weeks annual leave. We put aside our tithe, paid all the other bills and realised that we had very, very little to go away on holidays with. We sat down and said, well, should we keep this tithe back just in case we need a bit of a backstop while we're away? We can fix it up later. But as we talked that through, we were challenged. No, that's the Lord's money. The Lord gets his first. And so we contributed our tithe and we went away saying to ourselves, just as well we're staying with mum and dad while we're away because <laughs> we couldn't afford accommodation. <laughs> while we were away, we spent a couple of weeks at Ros's parents' place and a couple of weeks at my parents' place. They lived fairly close at the time. My father had a full-time job at a power station and uh, he also had a 
a contract that came up once or twice a year whereby he would slash several hundred acres of a, an army depot in Denman, just rugged terrain. And of course he was working, he asked whether I might be able to help him out. And so I sat on the back of the tractor dragging the slasher around this acreage for a week or so till we got all the grass cut, thinking nothing of it, just helping Dad out. And uh, before we left, Dad said to me, the army's paid me for that contract. You did the job, you can have the money. It was the exact same amount of the tithe that we put in before we left. That's the way God works. And I've got to tell you that now as a retired person, having come through those years of ministry, not really expecting to be in the position that we are in now, I stand in awe and wonder of God who has provided for all our needs. We own our house. We own all that we possess. We have no debts. God says, honour me. An attitude of gratitude. And I will open the storehouses of heaven and pour in an abundance of resources. Jesus emphasised that same teaching in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. He says, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Friends, you cannot outgive God. No way. So what's the bottom line? Is tithing the go? Well, it is for me. But that's between you and God for what you do. It seems to me that the Apostle Paul nails it on the head in his teaching to the church at Corinth when he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 to 8 these words. He says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Make up your mind through consultation with God how much you will give. Don't give because you have to. Don't give because some church leader says we need you to meet our budget. Give out of an attitude of gratitude. Give joyfully and God will bless you. Well, if that's been an offence to you, tell the pastoral team that you don't want me back again. Let's pray. Father, sometimes... There are issues in life pertaining to our walk with you that are, are not easy to understand or even easy to act upon. Help us always to put things into a godly perspective. Help us always to live our lives out of an attitude of gratitude for all that you have done for us and continue to do for us. Lord, for some, that challenge might be a difficult one. Give them understanding of your truth. Give them understanding of your will and purpose for them as your person. But in all that we do, Lord, help us to do it and to live our lives as an expression 
of our gratitude to you for all that you mean to us. Amen.